Good evening. Happy Friday evening. This is The Writ. I am here. My co-host, Mr. Mike Freeland, is not. He had to uh, take the night off. But hey, I'm here. Future Stars Now. One of our great and many shows on Front Row Material Brand. Tonight, we have an amazing, talented, and a veteran on the indie circuit, we have the aerial artist, Mr. Zenshi. Hola, como esta, mi amigo? What's up, Rit? It's Zenshi. I'm here on the podcast. What's up? Hey, man, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Excellent, actually. It's been such an amazing uh, year. Like, what a year 2021 has been. And uh, it's just been setting me up for so many amazing opportunities. And I am beyond delighted as we are. Hey, hey, 2021 is going out a lot better than 2021 came in. <sighs> Tell me about it. Tell me about it. 2020 was redonkulous, as everyone already knows. We don't have to re relitigate 2020. I think we all want to move on and leave that in the past. But 2021 it has been nothing but blessings. Exactly. Me, hey, uh, before the pandemic, the indie scene was getting extremely hot. Mm. Uh, you know, all these young indie companies, MLW, NWA, Impact, uh, GCW, they were all, you know, starting to catch catch a little ground, get a little momentum. The pandemic hit, and it slowed everybody down. For sure, to a crawl, to a crawl. It was, uh, it was crazy because I was really just getting my feet wet again in the American indie scene. I've been spending a lot of time in South America and Chile and Peru, uh, exploring, trying to make connections in Colombia. You know, my whole thing is I've been going country by country, taking it over. Um, and boom, I get back from Peru. Literally, I'm back for four days and they close the border of Peru. I would, If I didn't leave, I would have been stuck there all the way up until July. July Man. is when people were going home. It was so nuts. So to this day, I'm still in the last show in Peru. They still have not come back in a full capacity yet, but I'm thankful that, you know, here in the States, you know, we've, we've been able to kind of restart again. Yeah. Uh, a lot of promotions, you know, they started out with, uh, some partial capacity. Uh, and recently, you know, they're back to full capacity. you know, up in New York, you know, full capacity, you just got to yeah. show your vaccination card and, or sure. in, in a negative test, but you, sir, you have been tearing it up recently. Hey, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. I'm glad to see that someone is, uh, you know, is watching and and uh, is paying attention. <laughs> hey, I try to watch, but you move a little too quick for me sometimes. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. I'm smooth, though. You know, someone told me when I was training, when I was coming up, smooth is fast. You know, I used to move way too fast. Uh, and I still do. I get ahead of myself, you know. Uh personality trait but I've, I've learned to smooth it up in the ring you know i'm the aerial artist i'm not just a high flyer you know i'm the aerial artiste right yeah. you use I'm that smooth. you use that ring to paint <laughs> a beautiful picasso exactly exactly you know so, what's up you know what's up <laughs> and and uh jerry lynn he always you know was when we talk he'd always say sometimes you got to slow down to let the crowd get that reaction so you know what to do next for sure, for sure, because pro wrestling is unlike any other medium in the world, any other sport performance in the world. It, we rely on the crowd. You know, we've got to have that, you know, feedback. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a give and take. That's why it was so weird during the pandemic, you know, when some of the major companies were taping with no crowd. You know, you got you to gotta move on. You got to figure out how to move forward. But it's a different thing. You know, it's it's not quite pro wrestling as we know it. You know, for the it's the first time I wrestled in front of no, I've wrestled in front of the boys before. You know, old school beyond wrestling was wrestling for wrestlers by the wrestlers. You know, but it was different when that arena is basically empty, but you, your opponent, and the referee. Like we really find out who's good at this <laughs> when there is no distractions. <laughs> well, well, Zen, I'm kind of curious. First time going through the curtain, no one there. What was it like for you? The very first time, you know, it, it just so happened that my first match post-pandemic um, with MLW was against Calvin Tankman. 
Okay, big dude. And it was his debut. For some reason, they love putting the new guys in there with me because they know they need a challenge. I'm going to step up to the plate. And I don't say no, unlike some of those wussies in the back. Whether I get my hand raised or I don't, I go out there and always fight. So Tankman, he came in. Nobody wanted him. Everybody's hands went down. I was like, give them to me. People were like, you're crazy. It's going to squash you like a bug. I'm like, maybe, but I'm going to go on, go out there and have the best match I possibly can with the guy. And who knows? Maybe I'll beat him and maybe I'll be next in line for the MLW championship. Go out there and I'm focused, dead set on Tankman. He's imposing coming out there, you know. But for me, that was kind of enough to distract me from the fact that there wasn't a lot of people in the ring. I had to stay focused on my opponent um, and stick and move to survive. Yeah, and that is one thing that you have over a lot of other people. You got that quickness. They got to catch you first, you know. For sure. So, but Zenshi, you've been in wrestling for quite some time. What got you what got you interested in professional wrestling when you were younger? It's so crazy you said when you were doing the intro, you were like, "And he's a veteran." It's like I woke up one day and apparently I'm a veteran now. Like I still I'm still a kid at heart, you know, I, I'm still just starting, just learning. So it's like one day I woke up and I'm like, damn, I've been doing this almost 12 years. Like, this is crazy. I'm looking around like everyone that started with me are either, you know, uh, gone off the face of the earth or they're, you know, they're doing well. You know, it, it, it's so it's so nuts. But to go back to your question, what started this love for pro wrestling? You know, just like many, uh, you know, people watching this, you know, with my brother, older brother, wrestling around in the living rooms. This is the time of the Monday Night Wars. You got WWF, WCW. I must have been, I don't know, five, six, seven years old, probably no more than six years old at the time. My favorite was Sting. Um, I love the face paint. Every time we go to the, the town fair every year, I'm getting my face painted up like Sting. His favorite was uh, was Goldberg. Uh, his second favorite was Booker T. I kind of liked Hollywood Hogan as well. Um but after a while, you know, older brother gets a little bit older. He goes to work and I have I don't have that influence anymore. So I fell out of uh, fell out of my universe. It wasn't until I was maybe around 12 and a half years old, just in a pizza parlor on a Friday night. What plays on Friday nights? Smackdown. I'm sitting there ordering my pizza and I look up and it's like, oh, Friday night Smackdown. I'm like, OK, OK. And out comes Eminem. You got these two guys with fur mink coats on and this beautiful, gorgeous girl. I'm 12 years old at the time. I'm like, I am I allowed to watch this? Like, is no one's is someone's gonna tell me to turn it off. Like, my mom wasn't there. All right, I'm just enthralled at the TV here. She does the split. I'm just like, whoa, I, you know, keep cooking that pizza. Boom, they get in the ring. The next entrance, boom, pops out of the floor. Who's that jumping out the sky? R-E-Y. And I'm just like, who is this guy? He jumps in the ring, blah, blah. Batista comes out, and I'm like, man. So then they start the match, and Mysterio's just flipping on everybody's head, doing back flips and front flips, and I'm just like, that guy is amazing. And I'll have you know, around this time, I had also started uh, competitive gymnastics um, about a year prior to this. So I was just learning the back handsprings and the back flips and things like that. So I instantly fell in love with Rey Mysterio, and uh, I couldn't I couldn't stop watching. Every Friday night, I was glued, and that was the beginning. Man, that that when you sit there and said Ray Mysterio, I'm kind of thinking to myself, okay, now who was he teaming with? Because Ray teamed with a lot. He teamed with Eddie. Yep. He he teamed with Edge. Yep. You know, and, and he teamed with but and that that when he teamed with Batista, that was kind of like the odd couple there. You know? Yeah, I actually really enjoyed that tag team. You know, I didn't care for Batista too much, you know, as a fan, but for this some reason when they came came together. Um, it was just a really cool thing. I love the um, the contrast. You know, you got the little fast guy and the big, you know, the world champ. I love stuff like that. And then that has extended into my career. I love having style clashes type matches, you know. So when I got an opportunity to face Tankman, I was the first to raise my hand because I love that challenge. I felt like I was Rey Mysterio versus Big Show or Lesnar all over again. Oh, man. And you speak of that, man. I just remember Big Show with Ray on that stretcher board. Yo! Brutal! Like, like <laughs> man, he just, he, he was swinging that like he's Mark McGuire hitting home runs. The worst part is, not only did he hit him on the pole, so, guys, if you don't, if you don't, don't remember this, Ray Mysterio got beat up so bad, he was put on a stretcher, and there was, he was being taken out. Big Show's like, nah, I ain't done with him. Beat up everybody. Grabbed him up, picked, 
them up, put them on the stretcher, and hit him up, hit the pole. But then he hits the pole and hits the floor face first. That was like the worst part because his arms are by his side. I'm like, gosh, the, poor baby Ray. Man, <laughs> it, it, it was almost like that, that was all Big Show had was I got one swing and then I'm, I'm losing my grip and down he goes, you know. Yo, and, he's still a grown man on a stretcher. Like that's got to be not yeah. as easy to swing around like that. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that was crazy. So, okay, you sit there and, and you see this tag match. And you know what? What what's going through your mind next? You know, is this when was the opportunity you were like, this is what I want to do? You know, that's the next that's the next transition. So we didn't have cable or anything, so I didn't even know Raw was a thing. I thought WWE was SmackDown, but the Kasinski's commercial, I kept seeing them talk about what's happening on Raw, and I'm like, what's happening on Raw? What is Raw? <laughs> right. So I was only a little bit of access, but fast forward over the years, you know, through. You know, I got really pretty good at competitive gymnastics and became better and better and better at that, all the while becoming the biggest wrestling fan even more and more and more. About 15, those two worlds collided. It was around the time that, you know, gymnastics was really hurting my body. Um, I've had some health problems and, and the doctors around that time were basically telling my mom, like, he's never going to do any more sports and things like that. It's amazing he got this far. He should just be a book smart and and that's it because that's it for him. His joints can't take it and blah, blah, blah. And I remember her having that, trying to have that solemn talk with me one day. And I just wasn't having it. Like, I just didn't understand the severity of it. And I guess that was a good thing because my mind was focused on, no, I, what? well, they don't know me. So, okay, whatever. So in my mind, I, I didn't have any limits. Um, but it was around the time gymnastics was getting a little less fun. And I was finding myself really uh, using wrestling as a stress relief from practice and high school and things like this. So around fight 15 and a half, that's when I was sitting there one day and I'm like, you know what? I can do this. I, I think I could do this. I think I could, but wrestling also wasn't really cool at the time. You know, it was just kind of coming out of the attitude era. So it was like more of a embarrassing thing at that time. And I'm getting, I'm in high school, I'm getting more self-conscious about certain things. And so I kept it. I kept that you know, secret for a while, you know, I was kind of a closet wrestling fan that eventually only my friend, my small friends, you know, knew about it. Then eventually I couldn't, you know, stop it anymore. I would be decked out in merch all the time. And <laughs> it was around 15, 16. And I was like, okay, I got to at least try this. So I looked up how to, how do you start as a wrestler? I had no idea. And uh, it just so happened there was a wrestling school 25 minutes from my house called the WWA4 in Atlanta. I was like, WWA4, very interesting. So the website looked horrible, ancient 1980s kind of style, talking Yahoo pages, uh, uh, <laughs> looking uh, website. But hey, convinced my mom to take me down to their free show on Thursday. And uh, that's all she wrote. And now, was that your first live show ever? Ever, ever. Ever. Okay. Ever. So I got I to gotta find out, what did you and your mom sit there and and think because, you know, was she supportive during all this, you know? My mom is the most, Mama Zen, by the way, Mama Zen is the most supportive uh, parent you could ever ask for. And and she's always like, uh, you know, pushing her kids towards, you know, towards what they want to do. Um, but she always says, have a backup plan. Of course, her plan was always the college, blah, 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 get your diploma, you know, because that's all she knows. And, you know, I guess it seems like a smart thing to do, right? Um, so that's, she was like, yeah, you're, you're definitely going to go to college and do all that. But Hey, if you want to have fun, with this wrestling thing, I'll, I'll support you. Go for it. You know? So of course she took me. So we get to the show It's three matches or four matches. There's like 15 people in the crowd, including myself and my mom. And you know, there's students, this is a wrestling school, you know, students come from all over and this is the chance to showcase that in front of a live crowd which is so cool and unique about the WWE 4. A lot of schools don't have that. So I think that's a really cool thing. Um, but the show, the actual wrestling was pretty terrible. Um, they tried their best and it was my, it was entertaining just because I was just looking at the ring and, you know, I was just look, absorbing everything. But I remember the main event um, was the Hooligans uh, tag team. It was the main event. And the main event did kick ass. The main event did kick ass. And after the show... Mr. Hughes, total protection, Mr. Hughes. Hey, you know, he stole the Undertaker's urn, by the way. You know, he wants you to know that. Uh, Mr. Hughes was the head trainer okay. at the time. Uh, big old dude, you know. And uh, I didn't really know much about him, but 
my mom went over to meet him at the end of the show and I just wanted to get the wrestling ring. That's all I wanted to do. So I snuck inside the rings. I didn't know if I was allowed or anything when they weren't looking. And I was like, yeah. So I just jumped up in the air and threw myself on the mat and landed so awfully like that family guy, you know, uh, Peter Griffin pose. Like I felt horrible. I didn't know what I was doing. So I threw myself at the ground. Boom. Oh my goodness. It's technical difficulties or something, but all messed up as soon as my mom's like hey, hey come meet mr hughes and i i slide out of the ring and i'm like limping over there and trying to hide the fact that i'm all hurt and i'm like hey I, how you doing or whatever and that was my first experience at the wrestling show <laughs> man, i had to sign up <laughs> hey and a lot of people you know they, they see oh man it's like a trampoline in there no it's not you got you got wood you've got a little bit of, of padding you and, you got, and you got metal, and then you got that canvas. That's it, you know. That's so, it. That's so, it. so some some people underneath there's a spring, you know, some cables, but it, it's not like you're on the mattress at home, you know, in your bed doing bumps. Not at all, not at all. And the spring is really only there to keep the ring together, to keep the pressure, uh, you know, spread out. It's not to make it softer at all. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so you don't have that big show Brock Lesnar moment. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! That was crazy. Exactly that, though. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. okay. Uh, Mama Zen got you all all hooked up, and so uh, yeah, I was like, I, I got to save money. I got a job, you know, at Arby's, you know, making some roast beef just to save up the money. It was nine hundred dollars I had to save up to go do the three day camp. Do a three day camp just to see if I like. I saved up the money, drove my rickety car down there, and. And signed up. And I, I, I'll tell you, the first three months were the hardest. Were so I was bruised all over. My back had scars from hitting the turnbuckle. And it, it was tough, too. You know, Hughes was sitting in the ring and yell things at you, like, headlock, blah, 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 blah. And, and I'm not used to, like, listening. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a thinker type kid. I'm a, kind of an introvert. So, you know, it, it was very challenging for me to take all this information in. And I got real discouraged, you know, uh, in the beginning there. Um, but hey, I, I kept showing up. You just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep walking forward. Um, it wasn't an option to stop. Um, I, I, it never occurred to me that I could quit. So many other people didn't make it week, a week, two weeks, three months, blah, blah, blah. blah. But um, it just worked out. It also helped that I kind of came in with Apollo Crews, um, UHA Nation. Uh, Paul Cruz on uh, in WWE, he was yeah. he started a month before me, and he was just such a big brother figure. Um, so he was always a, a a place of encouragement for me to keep going. Um, Ar Fox started three years prior to me, and he was the man at the school. He's now the owner of the school. Um, he was a huge inspiration for me earlier to keep me going. His love and passion for wrestling is just absolutely unrivaled. And when I would think I had a hard day or I need to quit, I look at I look at Fox and see he just wrestled 17 people in one day, all practice matches just for the students. Then he goes and blah, 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 blah. Then he's got bookings. Then he's got – and he never complains. So I'm like, who am I to complain? You know what I mean? Uh, Jonathan Gresham was around in those early days. Um, Jonathan, I, I credit Fox and Gresham for giving me more training uh, in, the, in those first couple of years than anyone, uh, even more than – Mr. Hughes, the head trainer, Hughes gave me my basic start, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but really it was Gresham and Fox taking me aside and just pouring knowledge out. Um, yeah. Training, uh, training was, was very interesting. And, um, you know, those are, those are some priceless memories some priceless days. So usually, you know, after training, uh, how do you go about and get bookings, you know, or, or do you sit there and wait for them to say, Hey, uh, we think you're ready. Yeah. Um, so it was it was interesting because the the WWE four has that free show every Thursday, um, and that's very unique. We we're the only place in Georgia that did that, so we were kind of in a kind of a bubble. You know, we're focusing on training and and putting the shows on, and we really were. You know, we weren't concerned about doing outside bookings until at least you get to the six month mark or so. You know. Um, and, uh, Hughes had this thing that he really wanted you to, to, to go with him to shows. He wanted to bring you, it's just, uh, you know, our personalities kind of clashed a bit. Um, and, and maybe we didn't see eye to eye. Um, you know, I respected him and, and everything like that, but I was the high flying kid that 
They didn't know how to work the headlock. Uh, oh, you work the headlock, you know. And um, as a result, I went my own separate way as far as, you know, getting my own bookings and things like that. I, I didn't know also at the time that that's not a customary thing. Usually you go through your head trainer. I'm not saying that's right or wrong because there's pros and cons to both. But I didn't, I, I don't really pay attention to social norms or like subculture stuff just naturally. So I just kind of like, okay, you know, I'll just go, go out and wrestle. And I created enemies, you know, just because they got sticks up their butt sometimes with that. Um, but once they realize, oh, this guy just wants to wrestle, then, you know, they drop it later. I'm moving on a tangent, but, but basically um, I only did a few Georgia shows. Um, I did a show in Alabama or so, you know, getting my feet wet. Um, but it really, uh, it really all changed for me uh, in 2012. Um, in September. I don't know if you're too familiar with anything big that happened in the wrestling world September 2012. Ring a bell? September 30th? I have to refresh my memory. A couple of your listeners are probably going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah. So around that time, I, I don't want to talk your ear off too much. Let me know if we're going too long. Oh, no, yeah. no, no. Because I can talk now. <laughs> you keep you keep doing you. You keep doing you. <laughs> All right. So remember the gymnastics thing. So I was a gymnast, a competitive gymnast for five years, level nine, meaning I was one level away from maxing out as a child, uh, under 18 year old. You know, I, okay. I went pretty far. So naturally, you know, I left that Arby's job and began coaching gymnastics as a side job to make some money because sure as hell wasn't making money in wrestling a year in, a year and a half in, two years in. Um, and uh, all I had been doing uh, at this month, uh, at this rate is I had been going to Dragon Gate USA shows and doing tryouts. I got on a couple of them. Um, I remember getting squashed by Sammy Callahan and Eric Cannon on one show, you know, stuff like that um, early. But really my big break, so I thought, came when Fox hit me up and was like, hey, there's this promotion called Beyond Wrestling. And they're really, really new. And, you know, they but the promoters really got some good ideas and stuff. And uh I'm, I'm, I'm booked on it, and um, he, he gave me a spot to, to bring some guys to do a WWE for a showcase match. So uh, he asked a couple people, and myself and Baron Black, he wrestles AEW Dark right now. Um, he was the Black Baron back then. Um, accepted, and it was the match. Charade at the time versus Baron Black um, at Beyond Wrestling at this place in, in Rhode Island. Of course, we had to get there ourselves and, and things like that. Um, but it was a huge opportunity. Now, I had been really focusing on coaching gymnastics that last couple of uh, leading months leading up, and I had not been training like I should have. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I was a bit rusty. When I got that, that call, it was only four weeks out. So, of course, I'm cram training and, and things like that. Um, I got a little comfy. We get fast forward to the week out of the show. Thursday, WWE 4 show. Me and Baron decide to, to fight each other before uh, we do it on Sunday, you know, just kind of work the kinks out. They have a pretty good match, but at some point in that match, I pull a muscle on my leg, my left leg, kind mm -hmm. of, and it stretched properly. You know, I've been out of shape. And uh, the show is on Sunday. I'm, ah, I'll be okay, I'll be okay, you know. So I'm nursing it or whatever, still working, still coaching, doing birthday parties, what have you. I'm really struggling to walk at this point, but hot showers every day, slowly getting my mobility back. Sunday morning, my flight's on, you know, Sunday morning, I wake up and I'm like, man, I'm still not like 70%. Um, so I'm in the shower for like an hour, just hot water. And I finally get to the point where I could run with a slight limp if I hide it. But if I like forget, then like and step on it wrong, and it's a little weird, but hey, adrenaline, I'm young, I'm 22. Mm -hmm. Screw it. This is my, my moment. Get on that plane. We get out there. I, I, I'm i also underslept at this point, like most wrestlers are. Fast forward to the show, you know, 45 people in the crowd, which is huge for me. You know, beyond wrestling, I see some I'm Chuck Taylor, like some some indie darlings that I had been watching. You know, it's this is a huge deal for me. This is like my WrestleMania moment. This is everything. I have to go out there and steal the show. I have to go out there and be the best wrestler that anyone's. So this is in my head. I'm going off on this. So right before the, the, the match, I decide, you know what? I'm going to pull out one of the moves, you know, that uh, it, 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 one of the biggest moves, one of the biggest moves in wrestling. Ricochet at the time, 
I was a big fan of Ricochet. Ricochet, Jack Evans, and Pac were the only people I had ever seen do the infamous double moonsault. Ricochet executing it absolutely perfectly in the shot in this clip of Japan uh, for Dragon Gate that I had seen. And of course, me being the mark that I was, I wanted to be Ricochet that night. I wanted to pull out the double moonsault. Now, mind you, I'm a gymnast for a, for a long time. I can do double backs in my sleep, off the rings, high bars, on the floor. But on that night, hurt leg, underslept, hopped up on Red Bull, excited out of my mind for this, what I think is a once in a lifetime opportunity in a new state, haven't eaten very well. Mm -hmm. That was not the night. In front of 45 people, <laughs> not WrestleMania, that was not the night. Well, you couldn't have told me that. Because I go out there and we, we we have the match, the best match we could possibly have. But we get down to the end. I knock him off the turnbuckle. I'm climbing up. This is before the mask, by the way. And I happen to look out in the crowd and I see Fox, my mentor at the time. Oh, he's still my mentor, but especially at the time, you know, I really looked up to Fox. And we just met eyes for some reason. And I just looked and I just looked look back. And I, for some reason, I went like this. I, I'm not particularly religious or I don't know to what what possessed me to do that. I did the whole Holy Hail Mary thing and I jumped up for the double moonsault. And it was one of those freeze frame moments where everything stops. And it was like at that moment, he knew he's fucked up. You know what I mean? Because I did the first flip and then I threw my head back too early on the second flip. And any gymnast knows, they know, oh shit, like I, that wasn't right. And I opened up way too early landed on my eye, neck, everything, boom. Like, it was pretty wow. devastating. Um, I didn't realize how bad it was. I thought it felt like like you hit your foot on a door frame or something, you kind of shake it out, and you're like, ah, I'm okay. Like, it was just boom, 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 boom. Everything went like this for a second. And I'm on the ground looking up. But in my mind, I was getting up, and I was holding onto the second rope, and I was turning around to keep fighting. In my mind, the match was continuing. But if you look at the footage, I'm just on the ground trying to shake my leg out. And I'm just like moving my head back and forth. Like, no, I'm saying no, no, no. Like, or, and the, the opponent got a lot of flat Baron for trying to pin me after that. But they don't see that as I was going for the double moonsault, he rolled out of the way. So he didn't see the impact. He just turned around and noticed I didn't get up. So he went, goes to cover me. The referee is absolutely, is, absolutely shocked and to be honest he's just an amateur he's just a kid that's in there and now mm -hmm. he's just witnessed this yeah and so baron comes over goes for the cover and the referee gets down and the crowd is speechless they're just like Hoop! one two and i kid you not rick i kick out it was the weakest kick out you've ever seen but i my shoulder came up i kicked out and the ref said two wow <laughs> Baron did notice, wait, something's wrong, you know, because I still have barely moved. And right after I kicked out, that's when I started losing feeling in most of my body. Like, it was getting real tingly. I can only feel my leg, my left leg. That's why I was trying to move it around. And so he covered me again. It was at one, two, three. And, you know, stretchers and hospital and all that stuff. And and uh, long story short, I was so fortunate to be alive. You know, every doctor that sees it is like, yeah, you should be dead at the very least paralyzed like what like that's crazy turns out from gymnastics my neck muscles were so strong that it took most of the, the damage and it basically acted as a shield to my bone so it went through my muscle and what was left did hit the bone but it was more like the doctor described it as paint chipping off the wall versus like a, a true fracture as you would mm -hmm. think about it which is the best kind of damage because that can heal very quickly and it was right off to the right of my spinal cord right to the right of my spinal cord wow. like by a, a, two centimeters like it was right here so the, those factors combined uh they was like i can't believe i'm saying this but you're gonna make a full recovery um just you should never wrestle again you should never do anything again and i remember and i'm listening to him and i see that doctor the second time you've been told this Yes, I, I see that doctor as, as tell, tell, you know, telling telling us when I was 10, oh, you'll never do the blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, well, I did it the first time. Like, as all I needed to hear was full recovery. 
then I was like, oh, we're good. I'm in the, you know, in the hospital bed, like, but I had it just a whole, you know, opt optimism. And uh, I had a lot of decisions to make. Uh, I had a lot of things I, I could have done from that point. I think that was a huge, you know, uh, a moment in my career. And I had to think like, do I come back to wrestling, but be more conservative? Do I come back to wrestling and, and, uh, and just don't do that move again? Do I leave wrestling and do regret it? Like there was a lot of paths I could have taken. And ultimately I was like, no, I'm going to come back and I'm going to show all these motherfuckers who, you know, that I can be better than the best high flyer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, I can do this. Like the aftermath, I'm sitting up there in Larry Legend's house. He took care of me uh, the next couple of days. Such a good guy. Uh, Fox was, and Ashley, uh, Ayla Fox was in the hospital hospital with me and everything and I didn't take any pain pills after I left the hospital and um but I remember waking up the next day and and the footage was on Larry Legend's iPad because it was just he was recording for his own portfolio his own commentary portfolio mm -hmm. so he got the footage so he uploaded to YouTube privately and just sent it to like the five of us or the seven of us or the 12 of us that were there of course someone leaks it and by the next day like 30 hours later, maybe it's got 14,000 views. Then it's got the private link, 60,000 views. Then all of a sudden it goes everywhere like wildfire. You've probably seen this clip. When uh -huh. I describe it to people, they're like, you're the guy. Like people are like mind blown. Like how, what? That's you. Like I talked to Bandito this last weekend mm -hmm. and we were telling him the story. And he was like, wait, the video with the flag, the American flag. I didn't even remember that detail, but he, but he had seen it. Um, and uh, it went everywhere. Tosh.0, World's Dumbest. You're talking uh, uh, ridiculousness. Um, World's Dumbest actually interviewed me uh, on it. Uh, and they were they were actually really cool uh, about everything. Um, not much money, uh, but it it was a, it was huge. And it was huge. And thankfully, you did continue down that path because I, I can't see like watching your matches now. I can't see you being conservative. Like this, <laughs> this is you. You know, you learn from your mistakes for sure, and and you become better. And now look at you. You're you're one of the greatest aerial artists, the aerial artist, <laughs> and not Thank only just the, not just the United States, but you know, South America and the world. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be. You know, I'm trying to build this legacy. You know, it's just been so crazy. That was my my fuel. You know, all the the hate and the ridicule online. Imagine all the comments, thousands and thousands. It gets reshared all the time. Millions of views, millions of views, millions of views. And it's cool to see like some of my friends jump on the comments and be like, "Oh, this guy's actually pretty dope." Like, you know. And and I went under a mask as I when I came back. You know, I came back briefly, and you know, I, I, that's when I donned the mask. I was Shinron at the time. Shinron, the spirit dragon. I felt like. My former self was the phoenix that rose again from the ashes. Mm -hmm. I felt like out of that uh, that burning desire to show people um, that I could be the best flyer, that yang energy came out, the dragons. You got the phoenix and the dragons. Shinron went on a tear for five, six years or so. I felt like I reached those goals. You know, I was in the ring with my favorites, Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, the Young Bucks, Amazing Red. Like I was, I felt like I had done it. I had shown at least my initial, my initial thing. And at that point I was like, well, I need a new goal. What's next? Like, you know, that was my whole motivation. I got a little burnt out 2013, 2014. No, I'm sorry. 2016, 2017. And I need a, a reinvention. So Zenshi means complete history. So we've got the yin and the yang is now complete. I feel like I'm the most complete performer I've ever been. You know, I'm not just the high flyer, you know, mm -hmm. that was out for revenge. I'm not just the student. All together, you know, um, and acknowledging my history. And and as Shinron, as the dragon, I I would fiercely deny my past. I would, I didn't talk about it. I ran from it, you know, like it was I was a new different person. Um but I realized that was I needed to be uh I needed to accept all of me. You know what I mean? I need to accept my flaws as well, you know, mm -hmm. stop hiding and say